So it does say we're live. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. So uh, welcome to Summit once again. We're going to be doing some threat modeling with Jakub uh, tonight on the COVID apps. And this will be a highly interactive session, hopefully. So over to you. You're on mute. That's right. <laughs> Let me just share my screen and let's go. Okay, cool. All good, can you see it? I hope you can see it because I cannot hear anybody. Yes, we can. All right, all right, cool. Cool. So the plan for today is uh, a really quick intro uh, about threat modeling and simply few rules for today because um, I was planning that as an interactive session um, so that we are on the same side and we know um, what kind of input we're expecting in this session. Uh, so there are just uh, 10 minutes intro and then we'll generate the content and we'll do it in, uh, in Myra. It's actually um, you can do thread modeling in any tool. You can actually do it in uh, in a wide on a whiteboard. That actually I'm I I have one here. Uh, but for this kind of interactive session, presume uh, Maya could could be a good option. All right. So uh, quick intro is that I've been doing those thread modeling session for quite a long time, professionally as a pen tester, and as well for internal projects in our company. Um, and uh, I came out with a uh, few solutions uh, that help to perform the threat modeling uh, much quicker and uh, it works in, in specific situations. So um, many of the threat modeling methodologies work really great when they're applied in internal teams or uh, within meet on meetings with uh, multiple people that are not probably fully security aware, but uh, this kind of approach uh, really suits the best uh, if you're doing this as a consultant or simply a security aware person so that you can uh, simply jump out with a uh, good idea about threats and attack vectors. So five rules for today are, the, the first goal is that uh, we need to have a goal. And the goal is uh, not to generate threats, not to um, have, you know, a, 200 pages PDF file with the full threat model and, and perfect solution. Uh, the goal is that from an idea or an implementation of the system application or a process, uh, we want to achieve a, some kind of a secure software or at least a manageable, manageable risks. So something that we can accept or, or transfer. Um, and there are those threat modeling um, approaches and, and uh, sessions that generate a lot of artifacts and those artifacts are really useful. Uh, so first of all, you get you get understanding of how the solution works. Um, the key output are the threats themselves, um, and those threats correspond to uh, to kind of a quality of design. This is a, a short uh, diagram here of uh, like number of security issues in time. Uh, there is like a penetration testing round. You start from a specific number of vulnerabilities. Um, the quality of testing determines how many do you find during the penetration test, and then some of the vulnerabilities are reintroduced or new vulnerabilities are introduced to the system. Uh, so by having a list of threads, you, you get the quality of design much better. Uh, then there are the mitigations. So uh, after a threat modeling session, it's great to actually convert the threats uh, to mitigations, to recommendations that the developers need to implement. And uh, this also affects the quality of coding. Test cases, test cases work uh, also for, for the testers, both QA and security and penetration testers. So that's the quality of testing. And you've got some metrics. So in, if, for example, for the COVID applications, if we, in today's session, uh, we generate, let's say 30 or 40 threads, then if, if such a solution is implemented and it gets tested, security tested and for let's say 30 of the, out of those 40 threats, there are some vulnerabilities identified, that's great. And the remaining 10, they are, uh, are not existing, right? Or we can simply say that 
most of the threats that were identified, the, there is no attack vector for them. So that's the um, so that's one of the one of the ideas. Second rule for today is that uh, every session, every threat modeling session is is time boxed. We have a limited time for today. We have uh, well a two hour slot. I think we'll uh, we'll have like maximum ninety minutes of effective brainstorming today. So we do the bread search first um, approach. Why? And I always give this example of a one month of a hundred developers company, which has like 3000 Jira tickets, thousand code changes, uh, a lot of user stories, 20 sprints, because they have 10 teams, right? Uh, and if you wanted to introduce a, like a full threat modeling, um, let's say every, every code change or every, for every Jira ticket, it's simply impossible. Uh, well, unless you are developing a hardware solution that uh, it takes a really long time with the design phase and then um, you, you do the implementation and then you release the hardware and you can no longer patch it, that's great. But uh, most of the current software, it is uh, regularly maintained, is regularly developed, changed. And um, so for example, this company, uh, they have uh, they have a new release every two weeks, so multiply by ten teams. That's twenty sprints. And if you wanted to introduce threat modeling every Jira for every Jira ticket, and let's say spend half an hour threat modeling a Jira ticket, like a, a, or a user story, it will simply not work. If you multiply that, you will need like um, twenty threat modelers in a hundred developers company. That's not possible. Uh, for every user story, if you spend like uh, one hour every user story, that's also like impossible. Uh, so what about like doing a threat mold for every sprint? Uh, and it works all good if you, for example, spend one day modeling the threats um, of every new release. But the problem is that everything needs to happen on every second Friday. So it's, so it's impossible. So uh, there is a need for a solution to do it more agile. Uh, and we, and to find a solution that you can do it in a limited time. So the limited time is, is uh, we, we define, for example, for today, we've got 90 minutes and we do the BFS, not the DFS approach. So we try to find the high level threads, uh, the threads with most impact or the threads that we can identify the, in the easiest way. Uh, and we, um, we, we don't, get into the very details of a specific implementation. So if, if we can just close one of parts of the system, uh, for example, the COVID application connects to an API. So we, we can simply delegate the API threads to a separate, um, separate session. Okay, uh, there are a lot of method methodologies and nomenclature. Uh, well, there are, for example, Stride, it, it tries to, it helps people to identify threats uh, by, you know, uh, dividing them into uh, into those um, into those groups like spoofing, tampering, etc. Uh, the problem is that it is not always easy to to apply this methodology. And um, but Stride has has um, some very good situations where where it really works. Um, I would say also that. In the stride approach, we focus on more generic threats, uh, while, for example, the abuser stories or the attack vectors um, approach focuses on, on specific, uh, specific attacks that could just um, focus on one specific um, threat or something that will become a vulnerability. So like before you choose methodology, you, you need to answer a few questions like, are you talking to the people who are security aware or how much time do you have, or simply, if you will perform an update threat model later? Uh, it's a very, very important question. And well, who will consume the output and if those people are present on the session? So uh, the third rule, uh, we need to log output in some form. Uh, I really like the abuser story approach because you can convert the abuser stories into the security requirements and test cases. So during the session, you, uh, you write down the abuser stories Later, uh, it becomes a security requirement. So the negation of the abuser story becomes a security requirement, which you can pass directly to the developers. And also we can convert it into a test case and test case is delegated to, uh, to the QA testers or security testers. So uh, on that note, I have a question. We should do it, but uh, what is the best way? And I know you are a lone organizer. So normally you would 
need a note taker with you. Uh, I'm happy to take notes. Um, do you it's have a preferred po format? It's all right. It, uh, it's covered in my threat model. Um, today's session will be, that's actually why I chose Myra, because we'll write the threats here. So it will be okay. all written down here. Okay, and user stories? Um, well, this will be, so uh, let me finish that. Um, mm -hmm. So this is so like this is the perfect solution, but usually during the session, which, uh, for example, in case of uh, doing a threat modeling session in um, as a consulting uh, job, uh, you usually have few hours to, to perform threat modeling. In this case, you don't have time during the session to note the security requirements and test cases, but uh, all of the requirements they come from the abuser stories so it's simply a negation so once you have uh, written down the abuser stories uh it's all good because later if somebody needs it you can convert it into security requirements okay. um, but for today's for like for today's session i actually accept any kind of uh, any kind of uh, input and this will actually correspond to output because what is the thing is that some methodologies uh they enforce that you think about the threat and it actually may limit you a bit. So in this case, if you, if you are thinking about a specific attack vector, like changing, uh, I think it was somewhere here, like uh, direct, uh, direct object reference, insecure direct object reference in a specific API, just write it down. Don't care about that it is actually a more generic abuser story that is called downloading other client's transaction details or don't think about don't spend much time don't don't waste time during the session on converting it to a very generic threat which is accessing other clients data just write down either in this api and it's all good uh, because later it is convertible you can later convert it into um, into abuse stories or into security requirements or test cases can we use chat as well for this yeah, sure. I actually in the second part of the uh, of the session, I really invite you for uh, turning the mic on or simply chatting the um, ideas for the threads. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the fourth rule, actually, um, yeah. Uh, the thing is that sometimes. Um, a lot of different attack vectors or abuser stories, they can be solved, they will result when they need to be solved in one solution. For example, here we have um, two attack vectors, actually they're not abuser stories, two attack vectors, injecting XML strings and injecting SQL strings. These two attack vectors, they both have, uh, they both can have um, a global security requirement, which is input validation because and, and that's the reason why we, during the session, we don't need to think about specific attacks like, or maybe what if we inject XML here? What if we inject uh, SQL? This can be solved by base threat models. So if we have, for example, uh, the function of user downloading a list of transactions, it is a part of a SOAP API and we can model the threats for the SOAP API itself. And the SOAP API itself should have few, um, a few base threads, which are XML injections, SQL injections, it will be solved for the SOAP, each, each SOAP API method. And then later when we analyze the user downloading list of transactions or using the downloading their profile data, we don't need to care about the XML injections or SQL injections because it's covered by the base thread model. So it's good. It also serves this purpose of doing the BFS approach because uh, if we talk about the API itself, we can delegate some of the threads to the specific base thread model of an API. Uh, okay, uh, so the actually the fourth rule is that the threat model without an action, it doesn't make really sense, uh, it doesn't make much sense. So once the threat model output is logged in, logged somewhere, um, for example, here is a table with an abuser story, but actually the, the, like the proper way uh, would be to use the same tool that the developers use. So for example, Jira or any other ticketing software. So they have a user story there. You just assign a subtask of an, of an abuser story. That's, um, that's how it can be implemented. Uh, we're talking about threats. And this is uh, worth to mention that um, if we're talking about a specific implementation, we don't care whether uh, there is a vulnerability or not. Yeah, when, when, the, when, the, when there is a vulnerability, the threat together with the vulnerability will be a risk. 
but it is good to just write down the threats. Uh, and um, the existence of a vulnerability, this needs to be confirmed during a penetration test or, uh, or a code review. And then, of course, uh, the risk uh, is impact multiplied by likelihood, more or less. Um, so we can actually analyze some of the um, some of the threats by their impact or likelihood. And for example, some threats uh, are not really important to us because even if there is a vulnerability, even if there is a likelihood of exploitation, the risk will be so small that we don't care it, that we don't care about it. In this case, we can actually prioritize or, or deprioritize some of the items and accept the risk. Okay. Uh, and a fifth rule is that it is a brainstorm. And I really invite you to uh, you know, join the interactive part and um, give your ideas about threats. Uh, but uh, remember about the points one and two. So we have a goal that is covering the whole solution at some level of detail. And it is time box, so we have some limited time. So uh, I, I will give myself right to interrupt you if we're going too much into too much details of a specific part of the system. Um, I and mean, that's the part when, uh, when often when you're threat modeling a solution that is um, uh, that is already implemented by developers who are, for example, present on the on the threat modeling session. Uh, there, there are always words like, uh, you know, but we have a firewall, this attack will not work, or how about XML injections or SQL injections? Uh, that's the moment where I try to interrupt and say, you know, what if there was no WAF or what there was a WAF bypass, or can we solve the injection problem in general and not talk about 10 different types of injections? Okay, so that was an intro. I'll give a short example how this works. Uh, so, here is a password reset example. Uh, probably every one of you reset the password at some point in time, right? There is a, an email field in any application. There is an email field where you put your email address. It results in sending some requests to the server with your email. If the email is registered in the application, you will get, um, uh, you will get a message into your mailbox together with a token, uh, link with a token. You click that link. Uh, that's an example link with some token at the end. And uh, when the application verifies that the token is okay, it will uh, allow you to set a new password. And there is a last request uh, to set a new password for the given account. Uh, the threats here are blurred on purpose. So there are some threats there. Uh, maybe you have a quick idea. What could be a threat here in this password reset process? Man in the middle? Yep, yep. Man in the middle is um, is one of the threats. You would need a second attacker here. Yeah, what else? Account takeover. Maybe I already have access to the email of this user. Yeah, would okay. So, so for example, uh, for example, here you could access the mailbox. Yeah, there, there are like there are a lot of threats. So this is the idea. Uh, what about uh, weak randomness of the token? Hmm. Uh, if this is not really random, but this is an iterative number, then I can reset the password for myself. I will be, be given a number, for example, 220. And the next user who resets their password will get to 221, right? In this case, I just add one to my number and I will uh, reset somebody's account. Um, Sometimes it is not a number, but it is, for example, a base 64 of user email or user ID. Oh. So this kind of attacks, right? Uh, token reuse, so we can use one um, oh, access control. That's an interesting one. Uh, if there are two fields here, so the token and the email address, then I can try to reset a, uh, reset a password for myself. I'll be given a link. And then I will just change the email address in that field to another user. So that's the access control and, and there are some. So once you have all of these threads, you can design the mitigations. So uh, for example, the injection here, you can always inject into the email field, get an SQL injection or SMTP header injection. Uh, and, and you put input validation there, the thread is actioned. So, well, 
it is um, mitigated. So that's the idea. Uh, I've actually recently I've started a, a series of short five minute videos on threat models. Uh, that's the uh, that's the link here to the YouTube um, YouTube playlist. This is this kind of this kind of threads. The first episode is actually on the reset password link. Uh, five minutes explanations of how threat modeling works. So maybe maybe this would be interesting for you. Okay, cool. So let's go with the interactive session for the COVID applications. Could you paste that link in the chat? So uh, the instant threat modeling. Yes. Yeah, sure. Oh, now I can see the chat and Elab mentioned guessing the token. Yep. Yep. So weak randomness also works there. Thanks. Oh, and Andre wrote that getting email resets from Microsoft every day this week. Uh, and you're not doing it. So, so that's if their emails actually come from Microsoft, uh, one could actually uh, be trying some enumeration some of the application they respond differently if you supply an existing email address and the non-existing so in in very small high risk applications it is it is a risk that somebody will know who is registered in the platform or simply you know imagine a uh, some content some website content that you uh, would not like you would not like this information public that you're registered on uh, on some specific uh, video streaming service, right? Uh, so enumeration. He okay. says it is from them and that he's complained and asked to research, but they didn't do it. Yeah, well, didn't Andre, if, if, you were, if you were publishing your email somewhere, nobody, uh, you know, nothing stops uh, somebody on the internet to try and initiate the password reset process for for you and oh that's actually a funny thread there um, imagine a solution uh, office 365 like microsoft doesn't do it but imagine an, an application that when the password reset is initiated it doesn't send a link with a token it just resets the password and sends the new password to the email to mailbox in this case uh if if this was if this was the case for microsoft by knowing your email address, I could reset your password every minute and you won't be able to change it. So I'll simply block you out of your account just by knowing your email address. Not a great story. It's, hor it's a horror story. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so we go to, um, so we go to the interactive, interactive part of, um, threat modeling. Uh, the question is, uh, are you more or less familiar with how COVID application, applications work? Like, what is the purpose? Who is not aware? Maybe that's the better question. It's tracing people, but I am aware there are different um, implementations of okay. them. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with a bit, with a bit of um, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a Bluetooth. So I'll explain that. Okay. So the purpose is that, um, uh, that comp people who completely don't know each other, but one of them is infected and they met somewhere in a shop, for example, uh, it will be almost impossible for contact, like, uh, manual contact traces. There are people who actually do contact tracing, uh, to, to, identify that that particular person was um, in the same shop at the same time as the infected person. Okay, maybe in some countries they will actually get data from the post terminals if everybody pays with a card. But if you pay with cash, it will be harder. So for that reason, um, a lot of governments decided to introduce contact tracing, which works in this way that there is a mobile application on a mobile phone and it is broadcasting some identifiers over Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, Bluetooth Low Energy actually doesn't have much in common with Bluetooth, but uh, that's the other thing. Okay, so we have the uh, identifiers sent over Bluetooth. Uh, they're unique, they're pretty random, we'll talk about it later. 
Um, and then other COVID applications of other users, they can uh, see what is going on in the Bluetooth uh, ether. I mean, what is, what is being broadcasted and they simply save uh, all of the unique identifiers they see. Okay, and they keep this database on the mobile phone in this application. And once somebody is diagnosed with coronavirus, uh, there, there is a health authority there, but maybe let's, let's focus now on this. When, the, um, when somebody is diagnosed with coronavirus, they can upload all of their Bluetooth um, identifiers. Uh, for now, let's, let's just say that they upload both, those that they have broadcasting over the last two weeks and those that they have saved it, okay? They're uploading it to the server. And then uh, the server does some analysis on this data. And when the server finds out that those two applications were uh, in a close proximity, um, you know, for over an hour, uh, they should send a notification to the second one uh, that they may be at risk because they, they've been close in a Bluetooth low energy proximity for a long time. So that's more or less how it works. Um, now, because this is mobile application, it needs to be downloaded onto a mobile phone, right? And users download it from Google Play and Apple Store. Uh, it isn't a Google or Apple application. It is a, um, an application developed by, by a specific country, by the government entity. And the government usually employs a developer, I mean, a development company to develop such an application. So we've got a developer here. So the developer has the administration keys to the Google Play Store, to the Apple Store. They push the version of the application, the users download it. Uh, they are broadcasting identifiers, saving identifiers. Everything happens on the user phone. And there is there needs to be an API. So there is a server that is serving an API and this API handles a uh, few functions. Registration in the system, uh, it, there are two kinds of solution. There are centralized solution and decentralized solution. Uh, in the centralized solution, the registration plays a bigger part. So um, in, in some countries, you even have to register your phone number. Uh, but in most cases, you, you don't. You just register the fact that there is a new instance of the application. Um, there is the U, uh, unique identifiers generation. And here is a big difference between centralized solution and centralized solutions uh, for example, the UK NHS app and the Singapore Blue Trace, Open Trace, they're, they're centralized and uh, they, the server, generates the unique identifiers and they send it to the COVID application. So, uh, like, it's, and it's the first threat here. We'll, we'll write it down later. The first threat here is that the server has a connection between uh, users, the installations and the Bluetooth identifiers. So they could, um, they could um, place a Bluetooth beacon somewhere on the streets and they will know which application was near that beacon because they have a connection. That's all right. Um, uh, the decentralized solution is for example, the Google uh, and Apple exposure notification network. Uh, and uh, DP3T, that's also the pan-European solution uh, that is decentralized. Uh, funny fact is that in Poland, uh, the government actually tried to, uh, the developer actually tried to implement the centralized solution, but after a big effort over one or two months of the security community, we've been able to convince them that the centralized solution is not very good. There is a lot of privacy concerns. Uh, and they actually switched to the decentralized solution. They switched to Google and Apple framework. So this is what you can achieve with threat modeling. If you, if you show the risks, if you show the potential threats, privacy issues, maybe some will, somebody will change the decision of the implementation. Okay, so the, the third function is notification report. Uh, when the server realizes that the particular application was at risk, they send a notification report that you are at risk, you, you were at risk of being infected, please come to the nearest hospital. Um, okay, an infection report, so that's the diagnosis. I think that when, the, when somebody decides, uh, sorry, 
when somebody is being diagnosed with coronavirus, uh, they're given a specific key by the health authority and they can send um, the infection report containing their unique ID. So this is more or less how it works. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, in most of the solution, it doesn't use any kind of location data uh, apart from the use of Bluetooth flow energy. But for example, on Android phones, um, using Bluetooth is equivalent to location privilege. So the application that has the privilege to broadcast Bluetooth identifiers, it can also um, grab the GPS data. So um, another threat, and let's actually start putting threats here. Um, so I'll be putting them as, as those nodes. So we have the first threat that is, um, um, let's say, let's call it a malicious deploy. So a malicious deploy of the application by the developer or the government that will, sorry, do that. Meaning more, more authority. Auto. Yeah. Okay. So and required. So, yeah, that's right. At some point, the developer decides to um, deploy a malicious version of, it's actually here, deploy a malicious version of the application, uh, which on top of grabbing the blood of low energy data, it will also grab the GPS data and send it to the server. Something like this. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll just explain a few other parts of the of the diagram. So the server also has a dashboard and dashboard is accessed by the health authority. So they need, uh, they need the possibility to mark people as infected, diagnose them. Uh, the developer publishes the code on GitHub because even in centralized solutions, uh, in the UK actually the NHS app is not being uh, open sourced, but uh, in Poland and a few other countries, um, for a moment, it was the centralized solution that was um, not very good for privacy, but at least the code of the application was published on GitHub. Um, so in the case of a malicious deploy, uh, one could download the application to their phone, uh, dump it, uh, decompile it, and try to confirm whether it matches the code on GitHub. Uh, and actually, you, you can find an instant mitigation here. So an instant mitigation for a malicious deploy is, is a reproducible build. So that somebody can grab the application and check whether it is the same one that is um, being published to GitHub. Okay. So Actually, before we switch to threats, uh, let's just brainstorm an easy part. Who, as a person, uh, as, as, a, as an entity, a person or, or a company or, or a group of people, who could potentially attack this system? Like, uh, the, first, the first one would be here, a developer. People selling masks. Uh, so people who would want, uh, I'm trying to generalize that. So people selling masks are those people who want the epidemic, the pandemic to, to grow. Continue. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Elad says stalkers. Yep. So I have it here now. I'll just put it, just write it here. Threat actors will be here. So one is uh, developer, government. I just received an email from Open Rights Group and UK government has scrapped the plans to a centralized model for the COVID app and they're going to go for a decentralized model. Yep. So that's, that's a good decision, yeah. <laughs> okay. They uh, didn't even see, see our uh, threat model yet, but yeah. That's good. Um, th there have been more threat modeling sessions on COVID apps. Uh, yes, on, I was on, joking. On well, uh, <laughs> I really hope that this decision, this decision was built by, you know, facts and, and, and actually threat modeling. Okay, so we've got the developer and the government, people selling masks and people that want 
the pandemic to grow that's um maybe let's call them hacktivists or mm -hmm. vandals uh, hacktivists slash vandals slash uh, people who are bored maybe yeah with skills okay can actually mark here um well we always uh, always have the like competing application maybe there is a, there is another application to to trace people who lose money because this application is up uh, so competing application owners okay someone who wants to create chaos yeah, is uh, that the vandal? That's yeah, that's the vandal. vandal. Ilot mentioned stalkers, mm. and stalkers would be, um, yeah, let's say stalker, mm -hmm. malware operator, uh, surveillance. Um, Well, I'll give it the next one, an infected user. I didn't mention about one functionality that um, infected user, one functionality that uh, was in the plans uh, being implemented in Poland, status show. Uh, so uh, the idea was that in the application, you have a function to show your status, whether you are um, currently exposed to the risk or not. So the, the moment you turn red, you should go to the hospital, but nobody forces you because they cannot track you. But your status is not green. You could be you could be um, at risk. And and the uh, infected user, who was for example prohibited from entry to some places like restaurants or shops, they could try to spoof the status, show that they're green when they're red. So I'm putting the infected user here. Okay, um, uh, I'm adding third parties or even fourth parties. Uh, very often, uh, the application on the phones, um, it is using some third party libraries and some data actually leaks to third parties like data collectors, um, data analytics, this, this, kind of, uh, uh, this kind of things. Okay. Any other ideas? Uh, the health authority. Um, you may think that well, it's 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 a trusted party, but actually, uh, somebody could just uh, it's an actually a technique uh, like building attack chains. The health authority employees they may not be malicious, but what if they have a predictable password like health123. Uh, then somebody could just compromise their accounts in the application, in the dashboard, and uh, potentially perform more threats. OK, so I think we'll stop there. We've got a few threat actors to think about. And then we'll go, uh, I suppose we'll go functionality by functionality and try to uh, find as many threats as possible. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So we, the first one is uh, malicious deploy. Uh, let's think about let's think about what can happen on Google Play and Apple Store. You cannot log in to Google Play as an administrator and change the application. Well, you could if you compromise the third party. So actually what I'll do is um, I'll try to draw a trust bundler in. I'll find a way to do it here. Yep. should be like this and this these threats should be covered by like third party threat model 
So there, these developers, they have workstations, they're using emails, they're uh, sus susceptible to phishing. Uh, their company, they may have, uh, you know, uh, weak security of the infrastructure. They may be vulnerable to AD attacks. I heard uh, they were getting lots of emails from Microsoft saying their uh, accounts has been reset. Possibly. Yeah, so that's so that's the thing. Like your software can be fully secure, but if it is managed by uh, by an entity, you also have to secure that entity. For example, here the developers. So we've got a third party team here, but we but we think about uh, third party compromise. Okay. At Google Play and Apple Store, they have those um, review system, right? When you open an application in Google Play, you can view their numbers of stars, etc. Can you think about the threads there? Like the reviews? Yeah. Oh, okay. What, hmm. what could what could go wrong there, and by who? False reviews, but to encourage people. Yeah. So hacktivist vandals and competing application owners. Hmm. They could write fake reviews on Google Play and Apple Store, for example, spread the fake news uh, and uh, fake reviews. Here. Spread it there so that people don't download the application and it uh, doesn't work because it, uh, COVID applications, they need to have a specific uh, adoption rate to actually work. So negative comments, fake news, fake reviews, got it there. When we are in the PR issues, uh, somebody could actually false uh, send a false report of a vulnerability in this COVID application or a low risk vulnerability, a low hanging fruit, like um, some very low likely, very low likelihood uh, SSL vulnerability that to exploit it, it would actually to be on the user phone or something like that and uh, spread the fake news about it. So uh, let's just say bad PR. It actually bad PR and bad PR not only in the Google Play and Apple Store but in general. So I'll, I'll just put it here. Would it also um, so people who live in the same building or uh, in in our building, for example, if there is a supermarket below my uh, flat anyone who has been in the supermarket might be flagged as or anyone who is who was in a supermarket gets covid later i had no interaction with them but because it's 30 meters i might get flagged yep yep and also if you're working in an um in like uh, in a shared office environment uh, the Bluetooth goes for the walls, but yeah. the virus doesn't go for the walls. So that's the same there. So, oh, that's that's actually something I can call um, uh, bad. Uh, let's divide it into two issues. Uh, bad user experience. Uh, false positive. Yeah. And I'll just copy that. And uh, like not functioning properly or bad, yeah, I don't know how to call it, bad functionality or functional bugs, yeah. So it, it simply doesn't work, generates a lot of false positives or um, yeah, it doesn't serve in purpose. In this case, people won't download it. So it, it, it affects this um, application, not in security way, but uh, still it is a threat. Okay, I think we're good there on the on the way from the developer to uh, to Google Play and Apple Store. Um, yeah, what about this uh, the moment of installing the application? This is mostly covered by the Android and Apple uh, mechanisms that it is encrypted and should be signed, so it shouldn't be a problem. But uh, I bet that uh, the moment the COVID apps went up, a lot of fake applications uh, were 
um, inserted into Google Play and Apple Store, saying that they are copied up threats, you know, health check applications, but instead they're malware. So let's call it uh, malware disguised as COVID apps. Okay. Okay, let's move to the um, to the API part. Before we move, may I ask something? Um, when you were explaining the diagram, you mentioned something for the dashboard, saying the health yep. authority might be able to uh, mark people. That's here. Is so that correct, or does does the people have to uh, do it from their own phone, saying a health authority has given me this token, saying I am infected? So. Uh... There are two types of these applications, centralized and decentralized. So in Google and Apple exposure notification framework, it is the user uh, that shares their diagnosis key. So um, they, they just send it to the, uh, to the health authority and the health authority broadcasts them from the server. So instead of a notification report here mm -hmm. in, in decentralized solution in Google and Apple exposure notification, uh, it is not a notification report. It is um, a list of all infected Bluetooth beacons, Bluetooth unique identifiers. And this way, when it reaches the all of the mobile applications, you know, a list of 100,000 uh, beacons, one may check whether they have been in contact with those identifiers. So okay. it, it uses the saving UIDs path to to uh locally on the phone without connection to the server uh verify whether the saving uids um correspond with uh, matches match the um the ones broadcasted by the server. but centralized solution uh, like nhs app the singapore app uh, they actually the health authority gives a code they log into the dashboard they say that um, there is a new infected uh, person the dashboard generates a code for them and the health authority manually passes that code to the user and the user input outside of the system outside of this diagram correct yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, we can we can mark it here for example mm -hmm. uh so that's the code share maybe even on a paper or something yeah or a text. yeah that's right i was just saying something and then the user puts it on their copy up and uh the application authorizes uh, the application sends the all of the broadcasted UIDs, not the saved ones, broadcasted UIDs, and it sends it to the server so that it can send later a notification report and infection report. Um, the question from Andre is that uh, are the apps reviewed by Apple and Google before? Yes, they are. Uh, the question is whether there are surely, and I, I'm 100% sure that they review it before the first um, installation, before the first deploy. I am not sure whether they're uh, verified every new release, every new functionality change. Probably not. Uh, it also it is there's a manual manual uh, process, so it may it may not be perfect. The good good thing and a good mitigation here by Google and Apple is that um, they've introduced a, a great mechanism. Uh, the applications that want to use exposure notification network, they're not able to uh, have a privilege for GPS data collection. So even if somebody wanted to uh, introduce such a malicious deploy, it will not work because the application does not allow it. The, the OS, the Android system and the iOS system. Uh, but in case of centralized apps that don't use the Google and Apple exposure notification, it is possible such a malicious deploy. Uh, there will be a, a review, probably Apple do it um, more thorough. And uh, I, think, I think the Android apps, they're not reviewed um, such a detail, although for such a caliber of application, maybe they will. 
Uh, okay, okay. Um, so where we are, we're at the API. Uh, so the API handles information about registrations, about uh, generated UIDs, maybe if it's a centralized solution about notification reports. What if it gets compromised? And it can get compromised with like a number of vulnerabilities. So, uh, you know, remote code execution uh, can get DOSed or simply information leak. So info leak, any, any compromise of the API uh, could, happen, could happen here, right? I will actually, uh, so a good thing is that to, to put a base thread model here, because we don't want to model all of the threads for the base API uh, code execution, et cetera. We do a like a base thread model for API. And it should cover all of that. And that would be something we've already done as the organization. And we've that's right. That's right. Yeah, because we develop hundreds of applications every year, so we have a base thread model for APIs. And because we develop everything, uh, for example, in Java, we have also a base thread model for applications written in Java. Uh, well, the same the same can happen here, not only on the application level in the API. We also have the server-based thread model. So uh, any server exposed to the internet, it needs to have some ports open, for example, 443 for the API. Maybe it has excessive ports open. Maybe it has a, a SSH console, maybe some telnet console, SMB ports open, etc. So these need to be covered by the base thread model. And usually the, like, the recommendation is to do a penetration test um, of the external, uh, like external penetration test for the server. But we can also have just the security requirements that the server should have the only port exposed to the internet should be the API port, 443, for example. Okay, uh, so that's the base thread model of the server, server uh, of the server and of the API. We have um, quite a generic oops, generic thread here that we'll call information leak. So we have it there. We'll just put it. Put it here because there is a uh, writing a separate thread of info leak is, is actually good because we can uh, we can actually decide an instant mitigation. So what if the registration data contains a phone number and it gets leaked, then we have a problem, right? So the instant mitigation is least privileged principle. And do not store the phone number at all because it is not needed. So those COVID apps that store the phone number. Data minimization. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Uh, okay, so I attach it here. Uh, so what else can go wrong with APIs and servers? Write or share ideas. So you have a frame that is um, that has all the server APIs, COVID app. And that, is that like a trust boundary? I don't think it is, is, is it? No, no, that's that's just a frame for um, for the for like the initial initial thoughts, so that we we don't think about GitHub and user phone and dashboard for now. Uh, but the trust boundary is here, so we have a trust boundary for the developer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we should have another trust boundary for the user because, like, any input, uh, any input, where is here? Any input supplied by uh, by the user to the API should not be trusted. And also, uh, where oh here, we'll we'll get to these threads. Uh, but actually, let's mention one now. Um, if one application is broadcasting Bluetooth identifiers and those Bluetooth identifiers are saved by another application. Uh, then you can inject somewhere there. So the Bluetooth protocol, Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol, uh, it allows some kind of message format. What if you break this format? What if you don't send Bluetooth identifiers, but some text? Um, so I'll actually write it down. Oops. Yeah. So I'll actually write it down now. Uh, so here we have... Uh, Bluetooth injection, Bluetooth low energy injection in the message. 
and also denial of service. So on average, you're meeting, I don't know, a thousand people every day when you're walking through the streets, right? Um, multiplied by the, the tokens usually change every 15 minutes. Um, they're rotated. So uh, you could be actually meeting a thousand multiplied by 100, 100,000 people. That's a lot of data. That's already like at least a megabyte of data. What if you generate, uh, what if you create a Bluetooth device, a Bluetooth um, device that uh, every second it spreads another beacon? So we have a kind of a denial of service here. So we will build a device, and it's actually pretty easy uh, to build a device that will uh, change the uh, change the Bluetooth identifier every second, so that uh, you know 15 minute exposure to this to this device will result in. Um, so would that be on the um, OS or on the app? Would be OS, right? Uh, no. <laughs> It's it's different. It's, it's hard to, to determine. I would say in the application, okay, uh, because ultimately the data of the Bluetooth um, beacons it is uh, saved in in the application in the application store. So I would say, the, uh, but it's created by the device. Yeah, that's correct. It's it is somewhere there. Okay, I'll bring it closer to the user phone, but it is not on the user phone. It, it is, uh, it, it would it be a malfunction. Basically. Yeah, it would yeah. be, yeah, that's right. It would be a vulnerability in the application if meeting too many beacons will result in the application not working. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, when we have the government and the police as the threat model, uh, as the threat actor, we can also uh, find a threat that is, uh, imagine such a scenario. I'm, um, police, uh, you know, they arrested me and they have my phone and I have the COVID app turned on. And they know that another person also uh, had a, a COVID app turned on and they want to prove that I've met this person. Once they have arrested me, they can download uh, data from my phone if it is not encrypted. If it is unlocked, they can download the data and in the COVID app, they will find proof that I've met this person. Surveillance, we, we said something about yeah, that sensitive somewhere. sensitive data. Um, maybe not leak, but theft. Police scenario. Okay. All right, um, what else, what else? Uh, I would be very interested in a scenario by hacktivists and vandals or simply those people who want to sell masks. Uh, Elad says, yep. infected users may re-register to maintain the, their green status. Okay, so I will mark it um, on the status show function. Uh, app. Delete the app, reinstall the app. Reinstall. And the instant mitigation is the process that some of the apps introduced. So for the first two weeks after application installation, you are yellow. You're not green and you're not red. Mm -hmm. So uh, once you've been using the application for two weeks, you become green because you haven't been in contact with someone. Uh, but that's, that's, that's a good threat. Uh, I've been talking about um, a situation of... Um, Activists. Oh yeah, hacktivist who wants to, uh, well, create a situation where chaos data they want chaos. Yeah, yeah, chaos. A situation where on the server there is a lot of data that doesn't make sense, so they can send a lot of infection reports. Uh, so fake reports, and this thread is usually managed by the develop uh, by the design. So, for example. Um, in this scenario where there is a code being given to the user, so that's already a mitigation because the user cannot mark themselves as infected without the code. But the vulnerability, the attack vector to send a fake report would be to brute force the code that is shared from the health authority. So it is still an issue. Uh, 
Or we could do it in the dashboard by um, yep. impersonating yeah. the government official. Correct. Or authority. Correct. So we have, I would mark another trust boundary here. Maybe like this. Um, and same as here. Golf slash HA health authority TM. Uh, like the third party. Because compromising those accounts will give them direct access to the dashboard. Elad says yeah. someone may spoof the UID of an infected user and go to crowded places to make people think they were exposed and flow the hospitals. Uh, that's great. <laughs> that's great. I call it in, uh, intentional marking people as infected. And I will put it somewhere here when broadcasting UIDs. So the scenario is that we're going to the hospital, uh, to the inf infection ward, or how is it called, and um, collect the UIDs. And there is a high chance that in a hospital there will be people who will be infected, who will be diagnosed with coronavirus after a few days. So after collecting those IDs, we just copy them. We do a relay attack. We just copy them and we broadcast them in completely another place, in a shopping mall. Even better, if we understand how they are being created, the algorithm or something, then we can create them ourselves. And yep. there you go, thousands and thousands of them. That's right, that's right. So breaking, yeah, breaking the key to generate the UID. Um, this is looking know. like a business plan. Yeah. So maybe just weak encryption of the UIDs. So that's actually data de-anonymization. Uh, there are a few ways to de-anonymize the users. Uh, one is uh, in, a, in a centralized solution, the server has all of the information to um, match the COVID application to, um, to a beacon. Because I, as a user, I'm seeing only the Bluetooth beacons that change every 15 minutes or an hour, and I don't have a connection between this and uh, an installation. I don't have a connection in the uh, device ID, phone number, on the name. So I, I'm just seeing the Bluetooth beacons. The server, it has a connection between the registration data and the UIDs in a centralized solution. And in the case the registration data contains the phone numbers, uh, it, has a, it has a full data to be anonymized. The other question is, would it make sense for the government on the purpose of mass surveillance, mass invigilation, would it make sense to build a grid of uh, Bluetooth devices spread across the city and to perform the mass invigilation. Uh, I would doubt that, and I believe that there are cheaper ways to, to do it uh, based on uh, what GSM data. Yeah, exactly. 5G, <laughs> tinfoil, tinfoil theories. Uh, but yeah, there, there are cheaper ways to do it and effect, more effective ways to do it. Um, but what is cheap and it is effective is um, placing those Bluetooth devices in places where uh, which are dodgy. So if we want to prove that a certain politician or, or somebody important was in a place which is not considered to be, you know, um, yeah, wherever, uh, then, uh, then we can place the Bluetooth beacons there and we have the data matching this person with, uh, with their beacons, we can prove that this person was in this place, in this particular place. If there are like five places, this is this is doable and this is cheap, and uh, well, it is a kind of surveillance. So we put it here: data the anonymization. Okay. So the, government, any... the health authority officials might do errors, human error. Yeah, of course. So false, false reports here. What if there is a health authority employee who um, wants to spread the fake news? They want to spread the epidemic, uh, you know, um, false information, uh, fake news, and uh, 
make people believe that the pandemic is 10 times worse than it is, then they actually may have put some false reports here, diagnose more people than they should. Mm -hmm. uh, they could actually, oh, th th that's a brilliant plan. The health authority employee could uh, generate a lot of emulated mobile devices and uh, generate diagnosis keys, share these codes with themselves and uh, mark themselves as infected and they'll generate uh, like a hundred infected people. Yeah. And then walk across the city with those broadcasted uh, Bluetooth beacons. And two weeks later, there will be a lot of people in the hospitals. A doctor could do it to increase the revenue of the hospital. <laughs> Not in the UK. <laughs> yeah. And human error. Can we also add the human error? It might be okay. it might not be malicious. It might be okay. that I'm, I'm writing it down. They didn't understand the process and they gave wrong codes to wrong people. Uh, okay. Uh, so what else? Uh, human error. Okay. Um, those uh, this Bluetooth low energy injection here that it is an attack vector, but um, a result of such an exploitation can be a uh, few threats. For example, uh, if it is um, if this injection if this injected data will leak the whole database of Bluetooth beacons or the whole um, or the whole phone. So we actually, I uh, can mark here, Bluetooth injection, but let's call uh, application vulnerability that results in a phone compromise. So phone uh, application exploit leading to like OS, Android or iOS compromise. Like a privilege escalation? Yeah, yeah. And there are a few scenarios here uh, to achieve application exploit leading to OS compromise, there, there are a few ways. One is a completely external connection with Bluetooth low energy. So the application expects a unique identifier that is 50 characters or numbers, and you're sending a lot of them and you're exploiting the COVID application. And then either you achieve privilege uh, privilege escalation or not, but at least you compromise this application and its data. And the other one is, uh, what if uh, the, the user downloads on their phone another application that is a malware? People do it, uh, like those torches applications, etc. cetera. Uh, so malware as another application. Um, so oh, compromise from another mobile application on the same phone. And here the mitigations, there are, there are a few, like uh, the COVID application should be encrypting its um, storage so that the Bluetooth beacons data is not accessible for other applications, for example. All right. Uh, and here we also have information information leak to third or fourth parties. We're talking about those crash analytics uh, libraries, about the data analytics libraries. Trackers. Yeah, all of those trackers. So if during the registration, the phone numbers leaks to uh, the phone numbers leak to the third party, that's a threat. Uh, okay. All right, so let's talk about some threats more specific to contact tracing, not the mobile application itself, because uh, like all of those few, yeah, those four can be grouped into a mobile application based threat model. 
And this can be covered by like OWASP, MASVS or mobile um, security testing guide. Uh, okay, so the anonymization of the data, we've got it here, data de-anonymization. Um, collecting the data against it is intended use. That's actually more like a more theoretical threat right. uh, from the government. So um, they're saying that it will be used for contact tracing, but then they will introduce um, requirement of using the application to enter a shop or restaurant or uh, that was a funny idea in Poland uh, for a, for a very short time after the security community and privacy community uh, reacted for a very short time the Polish solution uh, was about to result in um, in discounts so you would get a discount in a restaurant or in a shop if you're using the um, COVID up. Rest in peace, GDPR. Yeah. Uh, we could call that like purpose creep or something. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and the funny thing is that uh, I assume that they wanted to um, tell the companies, the restaurants and the shops, that they should uh, keep these discounts for the fact that they will get some money from the government to survive during the, the virus situation. Well, um, okay, so we've got the uh, information, uh, the data, the anonymization, uh, using data against its use. Purpose creep. I think that's a really nice. Okay. Purpose creep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, faking status display, we got it. Um, abusing status change. Uh, so marking other users potentially infected on purpose. So we've got it here. Uh, Ilat mentioned that scenario. Blocking status change. That's funny. Uh, so in, in case this application was, uh, we're, we're thinking about, you know, 2050, year 2050, uh, you need this application to enter a restaurant or a shop. Um, and you know that you have been, um, exposed to the risk, but you don't want to get the notification report. You don't want to be grounded in a quarantine, like two weeks quarantine, because you, you've been in a contact with a, with a person uh, infected. Uh, so here you, you're abusing the notification report, the infection report, uh, yeah, the notification report function, and you block it. So blocking the status change. So even though the, the server tells you that you're infected, your status is red, you're blocking the status change, you, you remain um, green. Uh, okay, uh, avoiding infection report. So for this function, we, we could use to avoid it. Well, these applications, as for now, they're all um, installed by the users uh, without any, uh, they want to do it. So it's fully op optional, it's not obligatory. But for example, when it becomes obligatory, uh, then one could um, avoid reporting themselves, avoiding, uh, let's call it just avoiding reporting themselves as infected. So even though they've received the code, they do not enter it on the application. Uh, okay, do you have any other ideas? emulate, someone may emulate user identifiers until they turn green and then sell them off to users. Ah, uh, that's, you've got some good idea to make money. Uh, that's actually good. So uh, you, you grow these tens of applications for the, for the first two weeks. Um, for the first two weeks, they're, they're yellow and then they become green. If somebody wants a green at the very beginning, then they can buy it for $5. Why not? Um, and on the contrary, the, the hacktivists can buy the red yeah. status as well. That's called breeding application, growing, growing, up, growing fake applications. No, no. Grooming, yeah, that could be grooming, grooming, um, green UIDs applications, yeah, or UIDs. 
I would say with the current um, design more, we're talking more about applications, not UIDs, but uh, it could work. Okay. Um, I could jump the communication. So if I am a hacktivist, uh, I could just jump, walk around the shopping mall, walk around the city and um, jump the Bluetooth low energy communication. Uh, it's easy. It's radio communication. It is easy to jam it. So I'm just jamming it and the application becomes, uh, it, it loses its purpose. Not fit for purpose. Yeah. So we've got jamming here. This, uh, this network of fake accounts that Ilat mentioned, it may work in two ways. One is grooming green applications, but what about grooming red applications? So specifically we're, uh, we're sharing, we're, we're re resulting uh, in, in a chaos because uh, there is a lot of red applications going around, a lot of red beacons and uh, a lot of people a lot of people uh, land in a hospital, even though they're, they haven't been at risk. But for example, in a hospital, they get infected. I've got a good, um, good thread here. If I'm a, um, in one country and I want to spread this information in another country, if those two countries share the possibility to exchange the, uh, the Bluetooth beacons, then uh, one health authority from one country can uh, grow a fake pandemic in a second country by, by this kind of grooming red applications with an access to the dashboard in another country. Uh, so I'll just duplicate that also as HF of health authority of another country. And it sounds funny, but actually these kind of things happen when you read in a book 50 years later or 20 years later when they uh, publish the data from the Secret Service. Related to the avoiding reporting, mm -hmm. I could just leave my phone at home as yeah. the user. Yeah, that's right. Um, is uh yeah so that's the thing because the application is optional you don't need to install it you don't need to take your phone with you so that's more of a functional not security threat but uh yeah. let's put it here under um uh, it will be something close to functional bugs um well this uh it's somewhere between bad UX, a bad UX, and functional bugs. So, you, yes, <laughs> it it can't work if people, uh, yeah, non-functional bugs. But it is actually a functional bug, Ilad. Uh, so um, it is a functional bug because the the this uh, okay design bug. So the application requires no. It, okay, it is a non-functional bug. So the application by design requires people to have their phones always with them. Um, it's, yeah, it's something, something between functional and non-functional. <laughs> okay, um, we, what do we have? We have a maximum of half an hour left. Could something go wrong between the dashboard and the server? Yeah. Um, Man in the middle or something. Well, I, I definitely uh, put like a, a third party API. It is already API based threat model here on the on the way from the API to the dashboard. So I'll just copy it here. But is is also so we don't see APIs between the dashboard and server, but are they also communicating via APIs? Yeah, it should be as yeah, let, let's let's think about that it is just a dashboard. Maybe it's an API, maybe it's a uh, like a web application, it doesn't matter. We have a dashboard based threat model and yes, sure, under, uh, under the dashboard based threat model, we surely should have like brute force 
attacks, uh, dictionary attacks, uh, like password spraying. Our baseline threat model for whatever you want to call it. Yeah, well, like let's let's call it like maybe not dashboard based threat model, just a dashboard threat model. It is a web application, and like just because it is a web application, and web applications are well covered by like mm -hmm. public threat models. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we surely can think about brute forcing attacks because for them we can find a, a, a good instant mitigation like you know 2fa strong password policy and of course uh, the dashboard should be like secure in a in a, in a uh, OASP ASVS sense and OASP security testing guide sense um, so it should not have access control issues, authentication issues, etc. cetera. Uh, okay. Um, phishing. Um, oh yeah, I was thinking about this one. So notification report is a function that um, uh, it sends, a, the server decides to, uh, the help authority, the server send, sends a message uh, to the COVID application, to the installation that uh, you were at risk go to the hospital. What if somebody can spoof this message? Um, so I'll write here spoof notification report and you know, send a phishing link there or send some political propaganda. You already there. had fake reports there. Would that not cover it? Uh, no, fake reports. Uh, it was supposed to be fake infection reports. Mm -hmm. So and those got, are intentionally fake yeah, by the hacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, so we've got those two functions. Infection report is from the COVID app to the server. The user is marking themselves as infected. And the notification report is from the server mm -hmm. to the COVID application that you go okay. to the hospital. Uh, okay, so we, we got it somewhere there. Okay. Um, Abusing privacy, uh, that's, that's a very generic threat, but I was thinking about this uh, broadcasting, saving and broadcasting UIDs. Um, what if uh, I start, I, I put a camera in my restaurant or in a shop, or just I hack a camera in hundreds of restaurants in the city, or I am the city council and I own the cameras in the city, and I start to build a database of user photos of their faces and the Bluetooth uh, low energy UIDs that are being broadcasted at the moment in, the, in this place. Surveillance? Yeah, so surveillance by uh, correlating photos with UIDs. Okay. You can fingerprint uh, people. So surveillance can be done in, in, in many ways. Um, you can fingerprint um, all of the Bluetooth low energy communi uh, communication, the messages. Uh, they, are, they have the message content, but it also has the metadata. And the metadata is, for example, the MAC address of the, um, of the device. It is also, the metadata is also uh, the signal strength so um so uh, small especially at a non-busy place yep. you can easily identify someone with that because there's one yeah. person passing through and there's one uid so we can build a map of those uh, you can you can try to analyze the levels of signals maybe there are some small differences so surveillance by uh, metadata Mark signal strength, uh, time, location, etc. Okay, jamming. Uh, jamming. There's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, if you have multiple devices, you can triangulate the location. Says Ilat. Um, yes, you can. The thing is. Um, 
But the blood flow and energy works in small, uh, in like 15 meters maximum distance. So yes, you can triangulate. So you can build the exact location. Uh, okay. Let's just put it there. Triangulation by Blay UIDs. Um, probably it has already a, like an instant mitigation that uh, uh, there is not much risk coming from that. But you can good. put them on street lights there, that way. You would get good data. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, you can simply, uh, you can model the, uh, how people walk around the city. You can, um, oh, this this good surveillance but metadata, think about it. Uh, there is a, you, you have the Bluetooth devices all over the city and you can build this AI machine learning solution that analyzes how fast people walk and on a street that is not busy, uh, you can find a person that walks exactly, this triangulation may work here. So if, if you have exact triangulation, the exact speed and, and location, you can, even though the Bluetooth beacon changes every 15 minutes, the moment it changes, it is still moving at, for example, 6.25 kilometers per hour. So if you have a good grid of those Bluetooth beacons, you can... Uh, can do it well, but you can do it with GSM as well, I think. So speed, direction. Okay. Hmm, we have GitHub there. We haven't talked about GitHub. Yep, <laughs> GitHub compromise. <laughs> I, well, I mean, GitHub account compromise. But, yeah. But think, think about it. Um, GitHub as a corporation, they could change the code that is hosted on GitHub, right? They could, but I'm sure they wouldn't. Oh, this developer company was maybe, it was their first time using GitHub mm -hmm. and they didn't put enough control. So anyone was able to access the code and merge. Great. So uh, weak credentials, weak, uh... Bro, access model. Control. Yeah, we can access control. Oh, change control. Sorry, not access. Uh, access too. So uh, we yeah. access authentication and change control. So it is under the uh, third party TM. It's actually good with those tools because um, I could actually link those in some kind of uh, parent child um, relation here. Or they use so many third-party libraries in the code. Yep. So any vulnerabilities, basically, in the code. Okay. I think we'll uh, we'll stop here. We've used what we used um, around an hour, maybe oh. an hour in 10 minutes, which is just what 70 minutes. And we logged, I think at least 30 or, or 40 threads. That's quite a good output. That's two threads, per, uh, one thread per two minutes. If you have any more ideas, please, please share them now. But um, I think we'll be, uh, we'll be going to the um, Analyze this part. Uh, well, simply what, what happens now? We have a threat model. We have uh, areas that should be covered by third party threat models or base threat models. So definitely um, 
we've got the base thread model for the API, base thread model for the server, for the dashboard, which is a web application. So it's quite easy to, um, to build that. Uh, we've got the third party as a developer. Developer uh, threat model. It should cover things like the compromise by a third party, um, and weak change control, etc. And we've got the threat specific to contact tracing. So um, uh, here we also should add mobile application based threat model. Okay, so we've got the threat specific for the contact tracing. And for example, this is avoiding being reported as, um, uh, as infected. And also fake infection reports, uh, block status change. These are threats specific to contact tracing. There are threats specific to technologies. So the, the, the Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy communication has specific threats such as jamming, such as triangulation. This can be grouped into, all of these threats can be grouped into, into you know, a few groups. Base threat models, specific to contact tracing, specific to this particular application, specific to technologies. Bluetooth low energy, maybe Android, maybe Java, maybe Swift, et cetera. Uh, what else, what, what kind of groups we have? We have, um, PR. We have Apple, Apple and Google, the Play Stores. Yeah, the Play, yeah, the Play Store things. Uh, we've got the more or less PR generic threats. So, the, so the bad PR, uh, bad UX, bad user experience, functional bugs, maybe non-functional bugs. They're like the design phase and the and the. Uh, this is also the Google Play and Apple still thing with the fake news. So these are the the PR threats, purpose creep, etc. Um, so that's good. So they they can be grouped. And they can be actioned. So the, the proper way, this is the kind of output that uh, it is like a minimum output from a threat modeling session. Uh, now, what you do with, uh, if this solution were to be implemented uh, in the real world, we would need to action each of the threats. And for example, introduce a mitigation for each of the threats. So we've got a reproducible build here. We've got a 2FA here, etc. For each of the yellow postcards we need to uh post-it cards we need to put a, a blue one which is remediation or simply accept the risk so is the mitigation is it something currently we have or is it something we're gonna build uh it is something that we're going to build okay so or maybe uh, we can use two colors for the ones that are existing we can color them blue for the ones that aren't existed and we need to build we can make them orange or something yeah that's right um so basically with within the uh like a risk professional mm -hmm. naming uh, thing we have we have like four risks uh, for, sorry four thing four actions that we can do with uh, mm -hmm. risks we can uh, mitigate it accept transfer or, or avoid and uh, as i've mentioned the threat is not risk threats requires a vulnerability so we've got a fifth thing um here to verify so we verify the threat whether it has a vulnerability and then with the risk we can do those four things mitigate accept transfer avoid so yes blue would be for future mitigations the uh, controls that we already have, it is not a risk, so we don't need to, uh, maybe we can call it a transfer well, because... It, we... No, it's not transfer, so it is at an acceptable level because we yeah. have some control. Okay, so it is a, yeah, acceptable level because it is zero, for example. Um, so, so we accept it. Um, yeah, so here what we actually did with uh, third party threat model, we practically, we transfer it delegate the threat to the to the third party we can reassure it by by some um, service agreements with the developer but basically uh, usually the application owner the 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 the, uh, the entity that um, wants to buy the application they do not have a full control over the developer so they cannot impose all mitigations they can just suggest it or put them in the contract so that yeah. they need to do stuff. yeah that's right so a good thing, like if I were the government and I were trying to implement such a solution, uh, 
before any implementation, I would suggest to do this threat model, decide on all of the mitigations and access controls, and then put it in a contract so that it has, it has all of these um, mitigations in place. Okay, so once we have all of, this mit all of these mitigations or test cases, or we accept the, uh, the specific risks, uh, then we can build the uh, what to do with them. So, uh, so we have the, the thread or the abuser story, for example, jamming, uh, maybe not jamming is not the best example, but uh, spoof notification report. So the abuser story is um, spoofing the notification report, the security requirement for the contract for, or as a Jira ticket for the developer should be that uh, the, um, if the notification report should not be um, easy, should not be spoofable, but um, it should be signed, for example, signed with a proper notification diagnosis key. And this key generation mechanism and the key verification mechanism should be written down and, um, and implemented. Also a test case, a test case is easy. Try to, uh, try to spoof the report by sending um, a non-existing key, non-existing code, the, the shared code. And who would be creating those test cases? Is it a QA person or is it the security person? Oh, that's that's a good question, and that's um, that's something that needs to be decided in the process of uh, designing the SDLC process for the whole company. Okay, so organization so, specific. So the way we so I'm running like a trainings and sessions of threat modeling for the companies. We also uh, had a few weeks of designing SDLC processes, and. Um, Ultimately, it would be the best if all of this work would be done by the developers who are enough security aware to come up with the threats and convert them into test cases and security requirements. That would be great. Yeah, ideal. Uh, but, but usually, it lots of maturity. Yeah, usually in the very beginning, um, they need a lot of support from the security team, either internal or external, to come up with the abuser stories. Then I think like majority of the developers, they're smart people. So they can, they can find, they can uh, design a security requirement in the test case. The QA people can design a test case. The developers can design a security requirement and implement it based on the abuser story. So what they're, um, what they're lacking is usually uh, information and knowledge of the security attack vectors to come up with abuser stories. Well, when they have this, once they have this, uh, usually it is manageable. Okay. <laughs> What's the next step? Um, I think we like the next step is uh, I'm, I'm saving this output. That was a really great session and thank yes, you. Yes, please for... don't, don't, don't lose it. We need it for the website. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I'm saving this as uh, maybe as a PDF. It's good. Um, I will be uploading those data to to OSS GitHub, or do I just send it to you to outcomes at something? Right. It's. I pretty much prefer if you do it. Less admin for us. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and if you know how to uh, embed it in as. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Andrew. Yeah, that's that's my job. <laughs> uh, at at the end, I'm, I'll I'll uh, put a shameless plug. I, I really invite you to uh, watch these videos of instant threat modeling. This is uh, so. What we've been doing here today for the COVID applications. Um, I'm actually. Uh, it's very good that we actually found a few more that that um, I have already found. So. This, uh, this five minute video is a result of a, uh, like a one hour session. And I'm trying just to list the threats without any explanation. Um, list the threats, list the instant mitigations for the uh, highest impact threats. And I'm doing this in, a, in this form of the short five minute videos. So. You can put the, that link to, uh, to OSS website as well. There's no harm. All right, all right. Or put it and Andre, I think a lot is scarier than Jakub. 
<laughs> well, I, actually, actually, um, on the beginning of this session, I've just realized that I know Elad and I've been working with him uh, back in Australia. Really? Yeah, he, he messaged me on Signal in the same time. <laughs> That's good. Thanks, Elad, for, for your input. Fen thanks, Andre, for your for input, too. Okay, you, um, Andre has a question. Yes, sure. I okay. love pasta. Ah, it's it's a hard. So the question is, if the pasta and stride methodologies are they not followed formally? Look, I'm I'm not I'm not against those uh, methodologies. Um, I've been doing threat modeling for quite a long time, good few years of like professional threat modeling applications for our clients. And usually in these situations, we're given just few hours with the developers, with the architects, with the project owners, with the CEOs. And during this time, uh, and with our knowledge, with like when I'm doing the threat model with my knowledge of attack vectors, of the ways uh, I would attack this application, the brainstorming and the abuser stories and the attack vectors approach, the, the agile approach is, uh, is better because I know more or less what I'm doing. Um, I've, I've got a huge pen testing experience. So I'm doing, we're doing pen, uh, threat modeling before every pen test actually. So even if the client does not require it, we run a quick half an hour session, what we're trying to achieve during this pen test. I believe like pen test without the threat modeling is, is bug bounty hunting. You're just going through this application and you don't know what for. But once you do a threat model on the very beginning and decide on a high level threats, uh, so out of the contact tracing application, I would like to track users, um, de-anonymize the data on the server, collect user phones and compromise their mobile applications. It's a very short version. And I'm trying to find, during the pen test, I'm trying to find the attack vectors that match the key threats. Uh, so, We've been trying to use pasta, I've been trying to use stride professionally and it takes too much time and uh, it is hard to maintain um, interactive session using those methods. Uh, that's where, but uh, like the, the, you can do it in, with the elevation for privilege game, the card game. Um, so, but it also requires a lot of time. Reporting. So basically, do you write all these threats into a document or do they yes. stay on the diagrams? So, so I don't know if uh, you see my, it's just my screen, but I'll stop sharing. Yeah, so behind me, there is actually my main tool, this, which is a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And I usually run sessions uh, when I'm doing sessions online and uh, sessions, um, thread modeling trainings. So I just put my second camera there on the tripod and, and I write it there. Once it's written down, I just convert it into a report manually. Uh, I write it down. And that's because that's in the situations where the threat modeling process is not integrated into the SDLC. If the company already has or is planning to have a formal process of threat modeling, I'm happy to perform um, threat modeling in a tool where I can ex, um, export the data and import it into Jira tickets. That's the best solution. If I can, if I can get a list of, of user stories, convert it with my knowledge to abuser stories and log it as a subtask to a Jira ticket, that's the, that's the perfect solution because the developer just sees the abuser story and they implement it in a good way, in, implement it in a, in a secure way. It's actually a whole technique of, uh, naming the Jira tickets in a secure way. So for example, here, um, you've got a user story. User needs to download a list of transaction and their details. You can write it in a specific way so it will impose the uh, security rules. So the users downloads a list of their own transactions written in capital and their own transaction details. So in this way, when the developer reads the Jira ticket, they will know that there needs to be an access control for the user and for the transaction. Uh, yep. I wrote it in Polish. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Same to you. I guess that means something positive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh. 
Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any further questions, comments? Do you think we missed anything? Thanks. Uh, we, we surely have missed something, like all Not of the Not track action. specific, but in the process, or if, if someone else, if someone was ex expecting something else from the session. Yeah, more formally, we should go through the asset discovery at the very beginning. So we would need to uh, write down what are... So we did part of it. We, we decided who are the threat actors. Uh, the, for, uh, the second formal way of... Um, writing down what are the, uh, is what are the key assets. So for example, here in the covered application, uh, maybe if there is a registration, you do it mostly for the solutions that are already implemented. Uh, the registration data contains phone numbers. The question is whether the, applic uh, the application stores the uh, like the history of the phone number. Uh, then it is a key asset there. The key asset would be the, you. Uh, unique identifiers. The key asset would be data on the server that allows uh, to build a connection between the application and broadcasted data. So this is the key assets. So once you have decided, uh, threat modeling is the is, is you know an action of um, was actually showing on my screen and you haven't seen it because I'm not sharing. <laughs> um, threat modeling is is uh, is an activity of answering few questions. Uh, who could it, who could attack your applications? These are the threat actors. Mm -hmm. um, like what can be abused? These are the key assets. What can go wrong? Uh, these are the threats, high level threats, like accessing cl uh, other clients' data. Uh, and how, techni how technically this could happen? That's the, uh, that's the last question. These are the attack vectors, the abuser stories, the, uh, the vulnerabilities. So that's, uh, that would be a more formal process. But uh, more formal threat modeling methodologies like um, Stripe actually require to once, uh, for example, assigning a threat to a group like uh, spoofing or tampering. Uh, I usually, I don't care whether a threat is uh, spoofing or tampering. It, it needs to be part, it needs to be remediated. Uh, it needs to be actioned or accepted, uh, but I don't care whether it's spoofing or tampering. Um, if we have already an attack vector. Exactly, well, what's the impact and how can we fix it? But Stride itself, it makes very easy for people that are not familiar with security and with uh, um, threat modeling to think about threats because spoofing suggests that something can be spoofed and it makes their brain to come up with the uh, right threats and, and attack vectors. Uh, but if, if you are, uh, more attacker there are formal methodologies that are attacker centric asset centric so for example for aws uh, cloud infrastructure i would rather use a an asset centric threat modeling so we focus on the blocks an s3 bucket is a block the ec2 instance is a block so we so we do it asset centric right for this particular case we did the more attacker centric solution so we thought about what can do a group developer what can do a malicious uh, user and or those those kind of uh... and when you use stride does it does the session get longer or shorter uh, if it's a relatively new environment would you if i would say longer longer because you have to go through each of them and you might be creating and duplicating them uh, for different threat actors and stuff but uh, look, there are, there are a lot of uh, actually great people in the in the threat modeling area that use Stride and then and they use it uh, very well and maybe it serves their purpose. So I'm not saying that Past or Stride or, or Linden is is uh, uh, like the, there is oh the, there's the Linden the privacy threat modeling mm -hmm. uh, privacy uh, focused threat modeling. That's also great if your if your purpose is to find the privacy. Uh, focused threats. That's that's good. Uh, they also have cards. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe for for this kind of methodology, the agile abuser stories one. Maybe I should come up with a with a deck of cards. Um, but yeah, you're at the right place. We have a card game channel on Slack, and people oh, really? are trying to come up with a card game. 
<laughs> there are many people interested in it. Cool. Oh, no, that's okay. Okay, it's almost time. I'm a I don't know where the two hours went. It's gone very quickly. Cool. Well, uh, we we got pretty good input. We've got uh, we've got um, a lot of threads. Uh, so if if you know somebody developing a new COVID application thread, you can just uh, send them the link to this thread model. It will be somewhere on the yeah. RSS we've done website. it for you. <laughs> and um, that's great. Or if you want to convince your government government to uh, drop the centralized solution, go for the decentralized one. Uh, that's uh, that's a good, that's a good input for the discussion. That's a good argument. And basically, if you want to convince anybody, uh, your client or your boss, to uh, make your application more secure, threat modeling is is the best way to show the arguments, show the potential risks. Because if you if you don't have a threat model, you don't know what the risks are. You, you basically accept whatever is there. Okay, so uh, once thank again, this was uh, all from me and thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody.